everyone, and welcome to the Tuned and Strong podcast. I am Angela McHouston from Music Strong, joined by my co-host. I am Dr. Jen Cabas May from uh, from Tuned and Tone Performance. Words are hard this morning, uh, and we are joined today by my very good friend, Ms. Mrs. Sorry, Ashley Hagedorn Bryan. Um, and uh, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, some studio stuff, some lifting stuff, like just basically who is Ashley Hagedorn Bryan? <laughs> so why don't you go ahead and tell us about yourself? We'll just get right into it. Cool. Uh, well, thank you for the awesome introduction. Uh, I <laughs> am the owner of Hagedorn Strings. Um, basically, I just I have my studio and I conduct for youth orchestra and basically that like it umbrellas all the musical things that I do so gigging in orchestras or weddings stuff like that just like the typical what you would imagine a gigging musician would do just the performances and the students and there you have it (laughs) yeah yeah and this and this uh interview came up because we were talking in the last couple also about how um you know there's all this stuff that we wish we were taught in music schools um like how to build a studio and how to run a business you know <laughs> the uh so many things yeah know, self em- things really yeah self-employed yeah. musician stuff um so maybe we'll we'll kind of work through um the different things that you do let's let's start with the teaching um how do you i mean let's pretend I'm going into music as a first year freshman, like, okay, well, how do I build a private studio and how do I manage that and protect myself? Uh, So first off, (laughs) obviously um, you're looking for some students. That's Mm -hmm. how you start the build is literally with just one. If you can get that first student and keep them happy, Mm -hmm. um, obviously through good teaching, not just, you know, giving them discounts and all that other stuff. Um, They like good studios are built through word of mouth, not just Mm -hmm. online advertising Mm -hmm. or advertising in general. Um, So the way that I started building my studio was actually through volunteer work. Um, I am a former uh, public school teacher. but when I started building my studio, I decided that let me give back to the schools that like either I had come from or, uh, you know, need some more support. And so I started off luckily having a few connections because, you know, I went to school at Florida State and then I stayed in town. And so there were a few connections there, but for a person just coming into town and trying to get their foot in the door somewhere, volunteer work is the absolute best start for you in public schools specifically, uh, because you're reaching the most kids in one sitting. Um, And if you happen to like make a connection with a kid or two, they over time will eventually ask, hey, do you get private lessons? And that's exactly how I got some of my students. Um, and as soon as you grab the first one and that family has like really great things to say about you, you've made some good progress with that student, you've influenced them a little bit, they will pass your name to their friends and that's how you get your studio started. Can I add a, add a different version to that or see if you've done something like this as well? Um, I went to Florida State as well. I think we all went to Florida State. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> so right after I graduated, I started teaching as well. And uh, what I did, I left from there and I moved to Panama City where I didn't know a soul. I didn't know mm-hmm. any people, I, nobody, nothing. I didn't know where the store was. I didn't know anything, right? So what I did was... Um, and this translated to when I moved back to Tennessee is that I actually, uh, wait, before I get into this, do you teach out of your home? I do not. I, so yes and no. Yes, now in the way things have been going in the last like year and a half right. um, through Zoom lessons. Okay. Uh, but before that, I guess I should say I started off as a traveling teacher. I would go to people's houses 
And then um, I would offer a discount if anyone wanted to come to my apartment, which I had a few. I actually had like three students who came to my apartment. Um, and then eventually I got my own studio space and I worked, I, I paid rent to the owner of the space and had all of my students go there and required that all my students went there. I'm no, no longer a traveling teacher. So honestly, mm -hmm. I guess, I think where you're trying to get at is I started off as a completely traveling teacher, having over 20 students whose houses I visited on a weekly basis. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> that sounds terrible. I mean, that's so much. I mean, your overhead, when you say you're like, your, your overhead is that nothing because you're not renting. That's not true. The wear and tear in your car, the opportunity mm -hmm. costs lost in the travel time, all mm -hmm. of that. Um, what I did uh, is when I got to wherever, when I was trying to build a studio and I found that this worked pretty quickly, except Panama City, it didn't work at all. So <laughs> what I did in Panama City was I reached out to band directors and then I, mm -hmm. um, I went to like the local music and arts and I started teaching there. I think I had like, at my height, I had three. But Panama City just, just, the culture was different. So when I came to Nashville, I just reached out to a bunch of band directors and said, do you have anybody teaching private lessons? And they said, no, but you teach strings, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So, which could be definitely different because how many schools have orchestras? Not as many. So that's something else that like maybe take into consideration because I ended up with about like at my height up here, I had 42 students a week nice. spread over five different schools. So I would travel to schools and teach during the day and in the afternoon, all these different schools and boy, did I rack up the miles on my car too. <laughs> and I wish they would come to me like what you have but I never got to that mm -hmm. point like how did you mm -hmm. transition from traveling into a studio so um honestly it was kind of like a little bit of a miracle work with timing but um I had a, f a few friends who started their own studio that's part of the the miracle of that like happening because if they had not decided hey let's go in and build our own studio I would have not gotten a space um but a lot of people will build a home studio mm -hmm. um and I don't recommend living on a third floor apartment and building a home <laughs> studio because that is exactly where my three students came they trudged their way up three flights of stairs to get to me or two flights of stairs to get to me every single lesson don't recommend that's usually where a lot of them said eh, you know you can come to us it's fine um but if you have <laughs> a home um if it ha if you get lucky enough you have to be in a centralized area with your home like it's just you go from saying hey in two months we're going to transition over and if it doesn't work for you, it's okay. I understand. I can recommend somebody else, but come join me. And I didn't lose a single student when I transitioned over. I thought I was probably going to lose a quarter of my students. I was certain I was going to lose a quarter of my students. And I was still okay with that happening. Um, as I had a full enough studio that it wasn't going to hit me terribly. It wasn't going to put me in the poorhouse. Um, but every single one of them came over and that um i think that stands like to say that i had loyal people who mm -hmm. appreciated my teaching that they were willing to transition to studio life and making their way the inconvenience of making their way to a studio rather than the convenience of me going to their home um, yeah. it was very scary. I contemplated this for four months, I think, before I committed mm -hmm. to, I think I do want to rent that studio space. Yeah. How long had you been teaching at that point or teaching some of these students? Um, uh, my longest running student who is a senior about to graduate this year, I, at the time had been teaching her probably for four years. Um, mm -hmm going to her house for four years um <laughs> but you know what like I did what I had to do as you know a surviving musician you do what you have to do uh mm -hmm. but we had 
long-standing relationships. I think my newest student at the time had to be eight months that I had been teaching lessons for him. So all of these built relationships, it wasn't like, hey, I've only been teaching your kid for a month. Come Instead of me going to you, you have to come to me now. Like I had the, the foundation to be able to make that move. Um, and I don't recommend it when you're like trying to build your studio and you've only been teaching maybe six months or a year. Like that's, that's a really scary jump because some of those parents will be like, well, we're not really like that attached to you. Let's go find another teacher. Um, and not to say that I haven't lost students that way in the past. I have, but most of my kids, like I've been teaching for four or five years now. Yeah. And I, I think we covered um, something along this lines in a, a along these lines in a previous podcast, um, we were talking about, Angela, correct me if I'm wrong on this, um, basically gig work and, and asking what you're worth, that sort of thing. Pretty sure it was a long time ago, but I think we covered it. I'm sure we did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if I remember correctly, we were talking about, okay, well, you hit a certain point and it's like, okay, well, these low level gigs now that are like free or next to nothing, like mm, call this other person because I require this much. Um, yes. And I, I think what episode that was, but yes, we did talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. It was a long time ago. <laughs> um, but I think that's um, tied into what you went through, Ashley, um, with the whole like, okay, well, I've done my, you know, getting my foot in the door, groundwork sort of thing. I built this relationship with these people. And if you're a brand new teacher, I mean, and you, you don't quite understand yet the, relationship you develop with a student that you're working with it's it's pretty strong you know <laughs> if you're doing your job right it's a pretty strong relationship um but then you do get to a point where it's like you know what this is it's too much and i'm worth people coming to me or i'm worth this amount of money or you know and if i lose some of these students then i lose some of these students but you know at this point like more are gonna come like <laughs> more will come to you just ask what you want, you know? And as soon as I built the studio, like I had the studio space and I was um, re requiring all my students come to me. Mm -hmm. At that point, it was like, all of a sudden I hit the ground running and I acquired eight more students. Yeah. And that sound, it's crazy to think of like, how could you possibly take on more students um, after having like an actual space? But like being established like that looks amazing when you like parents hear, oh, you're going to a studio. That seems a little bit more important, a little bit more lucrative. And so um, they're willing to make the drive and spend the money mm -hmm. when you've established yourself. And then you also had the time because you weren't spending that time traveling from person to person. So exactly. That, Opportunity costs yeah. lost are now opportunity costs gained. Exactly. So we, that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the like the rent cost of a studio space was a set cost. Like the driving is not a set cost. You are mm -hmm. however much you were driving around, and let's say like, oh, that day I happened to be across town before I start my lessons, and now I have to drive all the way like five mm -hmm. ten miles to get to my first lesson you're really like losing time and gas money even though it doesn't seem like it at the time it really does eat into your budget and mm -hmm. I mean it ended up being a nice little tax write-off because miles do get accumulated and you do want to write those off oh, yes mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but still like it sneaks up on you those miles sneak up on you. And that, especially when gas prices were on the rise for a little while, like, woo, that, but like the budget was there and I had to like up my gas budget by a lot mm -hmm. yeah. while I was traveling. Yeah. yeah. I use an app called um, Mile IQ. I went through a couple of them before I found it. Do you use Mile IQ? Yeah. What I love about it, because I used to just write it down and then I would forget. And then, you know, every year it's like, what did I start with? You know, and then Mile IQ is great because it always runs on your phone. You always have your phone on you. And then at the end of the drive, it pops up and like, was this business or personal? And then at the end of the year, poof, 
oh, you drove 24,000 business miles. Send that to your accountant. Like, what? Mm-hmm. It's amazing. <laughs> At least I was driving 24,000 miles a year for business because I write off everything because it's all for me, it's all business. But it's like, you know, it adds up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So question. Um, yeah. Oh, we could go so many directions with this, but oh, yeah. um, I, I'm, I'm curious, like how you made, thanks for answering that, like how you made the jump from traveling to studio, because eventually I want my own studio and like, what are the costs with that? And I know Jen is thinking about that too. It's like, you know, when we're all like, how do we go from being employed by someone else to being self-employed? How do we go from traveling to established, all this stuff? Um, I, let's see, did I ever... The pandemic allowed me to start teaching in my home, but then I actually quit teaching altogether. So <laughs> it doesn't help. But when I moved to Nashville, actually, it's um, you mentioned raising your prices and Jen, we just talked about um, charging mm-hmm. what you're worth and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a there was a time when I just went, I can't keep charging this. I know I know some teachers are still charging twenty dollars an hour, which I think or a half hour or something insane. I was like, do you know what year it is? Yeah. That was okay in 1978. We're 40 years past that. This is not okay, you know? So, and th- but I'm, I'm thinking of one person in particular still does that. I'm like, it's not okay. And then she will chase down students, give them free lessons. I'm like, how do you make a living? I, I just don't get it. But um, I decided to raise my rates. And instead of just raising my rates, I kind of camouflaged it. I don't know if you guys have seen this book. It's called, for anybody who can't see, How I Made $100,000 uh, My First Year as a Piano Teacher. I've this- never seen that book before. No, it's brilliant. It's absolutely freaking brilliant. Now, granted, this woman lives in Texas, so take that with yeah. a grain of salt. But yeah. she, she did. And I'm curious if you do something like this. Um, she talks about basically you charge monthly or you you charge by the semester. Is what I did. I took her concepts and made it work for me because I I no longer charge by the lesson. I charge by the semester. So it's like if and I would change the amount based on how far I had to drive. Or if you're coming to my house, you know, and then we break it up by month. She has it basically, I would say, you know, like 80 bucks a, a month paid year round. So you get paid every month. You also have like a studio, a, uh, she called it a studio fee. I called it a uh, supply fee that I would charge, you know. So she basically you have monthly revenue coming in every single month, whether you're teaching or not. It's based like, you know, and does, do you offer makeup lessons? No, I do not. It's the same thing as going to like college. Do you, if you missed a class, does the teacher give you an extra class? No. Okay, same thing. You know, why is this such a foreign concept? It blew my mind. I mean, I thought it was brilliant. So I'm curious, like, do you, how did you set up your, your charging, your fee structure? Did you, the parents, did you go from per lesson to like a tuition base to, you know, and, and if you could talk a little bit about like bookkeeping and stuff and how you figured that out and et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. So. When I first started the uh, going to their house and teaching, um, I was doing, hey, just pay me by the lesson. And then I realized that that was just really like hard to deal with like all the checks because when you're, uh, you know, self-employed, you got to keep everything. And so yeah. keeping all those checks, that's Ooh, that got to be a huge stack and an unmanageable stack. Like I thankfully just like would throw it into my planner and I'm just going to show it off for a second. I'm not endorsed passion planner. They have a nice giant pocket in the back that I would just put everything. And this is a one year planner. So I literally would just throw them all back there And then at the end of the year, like, okay, let's put it, well, I put it in a Ziploc baggie and put it with all my (laughs) other documents that I needed to do, you know, taxes with. Um, And real, okay, so that got unmanageable. I did that for about a year and realized, oh my goodness, I cannot handle this anymore. Um, Mm -hmm. Because at the time I only accepted cash and checks. And for cash, I had a receipt book that I carried around with me, just a tiny little receipt book. And so after that year, I was like, okay, most of these parents, honestly, the parents also were asking, Hey, can I just pay you a month in advance? So it was like partly the parents trying to relieve themselves of writing so many checks or having the cash on hand every single lesson, because obviously you're not going to walk out the door with nothing. 
um, they have to give you something. So uh, I switched over and basically such less hassle. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and the parents were so much happier about it too. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I thought, oh, sorry. sorry. No, 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 it's okay. It's like, I, f I fought that process for a long time too. It was really the shutdowns that forced me into it. Cause it was like, I'm not seeing you face to face. So, you know, and like, <laughs> I had had one of my, one of my students ask me about it um, at first. And I was like, I don't, I don't like, I don't like doing that. Oh, uh. um, <laughs> just, just cause I didn't like trying to keep track, but being home, I'm like, okay, well now I have a binder for my students that I keep track of what we did. Um, and by the way, so recommend that. I don't have to remember anything. <laughs> it's wonderful. But oh my God, I really like getting monthly or bi-weekly. It's so much easier. Um, yeah. It's easier to and, budget for yourself too. Yes. Yeah, because this is yeah. a business. This is not a hobby. And no. parents need to understand that. And yeah. for anybody listening, you need to understand that. Don't treat yourself as less, quote, just because you're a music teacher. No, no, <laughs> if you're self-employed, this is your job. This is not a hobby and treat it with that much of respect. And your clients and parents and students will treat it also with that much respect. So yeah. even if yeah. it happens to be a side gig, it's still a business. It's still a business. Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. So I'm curious. I Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. You, you tried this. Go ahead. So I asked if you had like a automatic payment plan. And then Jen, you mentioned stuff about um, having a binder. And I used to have a binder forever. And then I traveled to all these schools and went, I can't keep paper anymore. So I went digital probably five, six, uh, I don't know, years ago. And I was using uh, my teacher's helper, um, which basically allowed me to uh, type in lesson notes. The parents paid online via PayPal every month. I just get paid. Everything was automatic. It sent the lesson notes to the kids who never checked, by the way, but it, it was trying to get responsibility <laughs> and like, okay, you got to log in, log into what? Write it down. And then they wouldn't write it down and like make them write it down and then, okay, put it in your phone. Okay. This is how you do it. And then they'd never check. I'm like, I don't care. We did this at the beginning of the year. You will check. And if you didn't practice, uh, not my fault, you know, and like your parents were <laughs> like, I would just shove that responsibility and make them take it, right? So I was doing my teacher's helper for a while and then I changed over to my music staff. Um, do you use either one of those or do you I use- I don't. <gasps> um, honestly, I, okay, so like I went very old school, like even when I was at my studio space teaching, I only accepted cash and checks. That's mm -hmm. all I wanted because it made my life easier to have like one spot. Like I knew I had all my paper yeah. records in yeah. this drawer of my desk right here mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. adding the electronic element was kind of terrifying. I'm not even gonna lie. Like I'm definitely yeah. like slow to grab onto things. Like even zoom lessons, I was like, Oh gosh, when the pandemic hit and I knew I had to switch, it's like, this is gonna go so terribly. I don't know <laughs> what I'm gonna do because my teaching style is also super hands-on. Mm -hmm. And so like just seeing someone in a screen is like extremely hard to deal with in the switch. But um, I finally did add PayPal to my repertoire. Um, <laughs> it was again, really tough. I mean, like luckily I already had a PayPal account because you know, eBay and other things. And so I figured that was probably the easiest one for me to keep track of because for the business stuff, like you can print out um, yeah. all the payments that a certain person makes mm -hmm. over the course of a year. You can send invoices to people. Yes. So if they happen to forget, mm -hmm. um, you send the invoice and it's a reminder and it's also a paper trail in case mm -hmm. maybe down the line you have a parent who hasn't quite paid you and needs to pay you and like you now have, you I've said that again, say that again, I'm sorry. You charge late fees? I used to. Um, with pandemic, I eased up a little bit because things were just kind of crazy. And I also offered, you know, I, I'm also a stay at home mom. So there is like the benefit of, um, my schedule being pretty flexible. And so, um, I didn't quite, I would offer maybe, uh, you know, let's move a lesson, um, or make up a lesson, especially if it was my fault. 
because gigging musician, you have to kick kids off of certain days if there's a rehearsal or a concert or whatever. Um, but definitely nowadays, a lot more lenient with that. So in to go with that, I don't necessarily charge late fees because everything is electronic and I'm giving grace to everybody because I feel like that's like that's needed, especially now. Um, but again, a lot of those parents, I I've only taken on maybe two new students, three new students since the pandemic started. And so again, I had established relationships with all those parents and they pay me on time every single month. It's not mm -hmm. something that I have to fight with them over. Good. So do you have a contract as well that you make the, the parents and the students sign? I, yeah, when they start lessons, I do. It's a practice contract slash uh, studio policies contract. Mm -hmm. And um, like generally it's basically like, hey, I commit to practicing and you know, there's gonna be the kids who don't and you're still willing to take their money. Um, but that's then a conversation on the side with the parent of, hey, your investment is not quite panning out here, um, mm -hmm. which I have had to do a few times, but I, it's got that on there. Um, and it also has my policy for the makeup lessons, which uh, nowadays is a little bit more lenient. It has, if you, you know, don't pay me the no show, no call, you pay me the entire lesson fee. Um, mm -hmm. I have for um, canceled lessons, because that, you know, you have to have, again, grace when it comes to situations. If it's not an absolute emergency, they have to cancel 12 hours ahead of time, either through sending me a text message or usually text message is how I go about most of my business. Um, email, I had maybe one parent who refused to do text messages because they were super old school and I had to email back and forth with them. And luckily our technology has, you know, email. So right. it's basically like text message, sort of a little bit more formal. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting how our different businesses, because we've all taught, like you guys are still teaching and I'm only teaching at the mm -hmm. college level now, but I, you know, when I got this whole thing set up as like, this was my, my, my gig. And um, uh, it's, it's cool to see how we've done it all kind of different, different ways. I mean, mm -hmm. like I got, I know that this is kind of interesting, kind of gets into like mindset a little bit, but I got to the point where I realized I really didn't want to teach that much anymore. And so I was okay with just laying down the law and like, I do not charge by the lesson. If you miss, that's too bad. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry. I mean, it's just, you're, you're paying for the semester. It yeah. starts here. It ends here. However many, well, how many lessons is that? I don't know. I don't know. I don't care. But you get this semester. This is what it is, you know? And I got to the point where I could just say that. I'm like, it doesn't matter what it is. You're holding this spot in my studio. Do you want that spot? You know, I've been teaching for blah, blah, blah years and playing blah, blah, you know, it's like, and I had no problem starting. And they're like, well, that's too much. I'm like, okay, then I'm not the studio for you. It was a nice place to get to that point where I could say that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'd like to be able to say that like in all areas, but it takes some time to be able to just be like, no, this is my time. It's worth this. I'm, we're going to mm -hmm. have great lessons. We're going to learn a lot, but I don't, this is how I do it. Period. You're going to sign up for this. You're going to do this, but this is how, this is, these are the studio policies, even though I'm coming mm -hmm. to your school. But I mean, when I got rid of makeup lessons, oh, it was nice because they wouldn't show up anyway. <laughs> it was I thought it was weird. Right. So I wasn't trying to like be rude or anything. It was just like, look, I'm driving. I'm thinking of one in particular, like there's one school, their schedule was always crazy. I couldn't depend on it and I couldn't schedule it. Another one, they might not show up. Another one, I would drive an hour one way and they may or may not show up. So I just quit. I tried it one year. I offered one makeup day at the end of the, it, that came from this book. Like you offered one makeup day at the end of the semester or I think, yeah. And uh, I tried it once and I had two people and I went, I'm not driving an hour one way for two people ever again. It is this semester, it is this, this is, we go January to May, however many it is, great. And you know, the, the, the scheduling app allowed the, like, the kids to see, I had it set up so they could switch times with other kids if they needed to. So it took me out of it too. They're like, hey, my, this period is this, like log in, ask her if it's okay, switch time yourself. So the more responsibility I could give to the kids, the better. 
um, whether they took it or not, eh, you know, <laughs> the parents mm -hmm. too. But yeah. it was just kind of nice to get to that that mindset of I know my worth, I know what we're we're gonna learn, and this is what I expect. And uh, mm -hmm. it was kind of it was a good feeling to get to that place. Unfortunately, yeah. it was like at the end of my teaching career when I didn't want to do it anymore. Yeah, but I, I think too that it's kind of kind of tying that back into the contract thing that we we're talking about. Um, I think it's really a lot of young teachers are very afraid to ask for a contract because they think they're going to lose people or oh, you know, I'm going to scare people off. I'm like, I really wish that I had done it sooner. Do and I really think that even like your first year, you're going to try to figure out who you are as a teacher. You're going to try to figure out that that's fine. Maybe even the first two years, but by the time you hit year three, set some ground rules, even if you don't enforce them. This is actually, I actually going to sell myself out here a little bit. I didn't start doing this until I started teaching college because they required it in the syllabus. They're like, Oh, you need a syllabus. And I'm like, but I'm a flexible teacher. No, you need a syllabus. Okay. So here are all the ground rules. And I'd even, you know, sit down with my students at the beginning of the semester and go, okay, here are the rules. They're, they look strict and go, but I'm a reasonable person. If you talk to me, we can work something out, but you have to communicate with, that's what I'm asking for. That's what I'm asking for. But once I did that, I really liked, I, I really liked that when certain students would start like goofing off or not showing up or whatever, I'm like, great. I now have protection. Mm -hmm. I can do exactly what I need to do to handle this situation. Like, no, you're going to fail my class because you keep no call, no showing. And you agreed to this because day one, not only do I have the syllabus posted, which is all the legal requirement I need for the school, but day one, we went through the syllabus. You know what you agreed to. I had you sign the syllabus. Like, <laughs> not my fault if you fail. But then I had the wiggle room for like, um, okay, somebody missed my cancellation window because a parent died. Great. Now I can work with you. You know what I mean? Like I can be flexible. Yeah. But we have that relationship. You haven't been messing up. This is a specific situation. If I need to enforce, I can, but I can also be flexible when I need to. I'm like that. That is a lot of freedom as a teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What Which I know, it, Ashley. Sorry. I was going to say, when it comes to like running a, like this could be a free for all here, but oh when boy. <laughs> a, running a studio, like what are the things business wise, like what are the things they didn't teach you in music school that you wish you had learned? before you set up, set foot out as an entrepreneur, like, I don't know, it could be, it could be anything from, from business know-how contract apps. It, it, I don't know. Uh, I mean, that's a good place to start apps. Like mm -hmm. they don't teach, actually, I'm going to back up for a second in, at least from my experience in music school and those that I've talked to, um, for basic, like just bachelors in music, whether it's performance or education or whatnot. And education, like that's more set to like, you're going to teach in a, a school setting, but the bachelor in music performance or music, just general music, there absolutely should be a, a class or something that covers how to do your taxes as a self-employed yes. person. Yes. Um, because that's, that literally hits every musician. <laughs> like, yes. even if you're side gigging <laughs> as a school teacher, which I did in my seven years as a school teacher, you didn't get taught what self-tax was and what the tax brackets were going to be. And I mean, like, that's mm -hmm. kind of like mm -hmm. a general thing for a lot of people, but musicians in particular, like we are a self-employed person, like that's mm -hmm. just how our business works. And so mm -hmm. having that embedded in our classes um how to market yourself <laughs> yes that's completely missing like it's kind of just something that everyone just assumes you know how to do like mm -hmm. even when I did my um solo recitals like you had to put a poster out or you didn't I guess, I guess you didn't have to do any of that you could just play your solo right. recital and no one could show up and you'd still get your credit right but we will be forced to take a marketing class. Honestly. Yes. 
And so like knowing how to do graphics for your business or graphics for your advertising um, is super important. And luckily, like I had that in high school. I was very lucky to like get some graphics design stuff in high school so that I could transfer it over to now. Um, you so I was designing my own posters and designing, you know, my own flyers and yeah. business cards and things. Um, you use anything for your graphic design now? I mean, I have somebody working for me, but she's using Canva and that's what I was using before. Uh, I think, so I have somebody who also does like the, she made my logo and stuff. And I think she also used Canva, but just in general, like you can easily turn Microsoft Word into a poster maker. Oh, yeah. Like, there are really interesting ways you can go about it. And so honestly, that's what I did. I just used Microsoft Word and just went right. landscape and then did, you can add graphics in there and mm -hmm. import mm -hmm. whatever you want. Uh, but just yeah. like having a class on how to do that in the first place, because that is just such an essential part of your business. Like, yeah, I have to have a logo on the things yes. that are attached to me so that yeah. it gets around. Um, yep. And also in doing so added benefit of social media working for you in the same facet. No, like that yes. again, is just music school is about getting better at your instrument and like basically mm -hmm. nothing else. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of components missing for specifically music performance majors, I feel. Yeah. Um, Cause I did get a little bit of that in music education. We did have to take a little bit on like how to set up a running classroom and how to write a syllabus mm -hmm. and how to do graphics a little bit on online, but it was, you know, just a little bit, just a tiny bit. Yeah. Um, I also wish that they had like some sort of how to, how to talk to people, tact, mm -hmm. how to, how to get your foot in the door. Um, and again, that's something that you just are assumed to have when you get into music school. And that's a lot of people don't have it. And then when they fail in the music business, it wasn't mm -hmm. what they dreamed it would be. Um, they end up switching careers. Not to say that people who are switching careers were failures in music. Like sometimes, you know, you just have like a change of heart and this other career was just seems so much better. And I, I'm glad I did it, but a, a good number of people end up switching careers because they couldn't make it in this like self-employment business. Because we're not taught how to be self-employed. Mm -hmm. You're just expected to know yeah. which is asinine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're taught how to play your instrument and do the thing, but not all the background things. And so like you get a lot mm -hmm. of people who get in financial troubles when they weren't mm -hmm. told that they needed to pay uh, quarterly taxes. That was something that hit yeah. me real hard the first mm -hmm. time I had to do, when I realized I had to do that. Oh boy. Like, yeah. thank goodness I had a tax professional I talked to because there was many tears in trying to do online, like just take care of my taxes on like TurboTax. And then it was like, yeah, it oh, hey, you're self-employed. Actually, you have to pay like 50 extra dollars to get this form. And then, oh, wait, you do gig work, uh, you have to pay another $70. And yeah. then after <laughs> yeah. all of that, yeah. then you're paying the government $1,100 right. because right. nobody told you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a good, <laughs> Angela, you said CPA. <laughs> like a good yeah. CPA. Get a CPA. Yeah. How many times? Is, please do. Because you will screw something up and you don't want to be audited. Right. Because right. once you have this job, all these 1099s and then self-employment this and all these, da, 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 you're going to screw mm -hmm. something up and then you're going to miss mm -hmm. something like, oh, did you take this off? Learning about deductions. Oh yeah. God, I deduct yeah. everything. Like yes. we're doing this podcast in my house. I deduct mm -hmm. my internet. I have clients come over. Mm -hmm. I deduct my part of my mortgage for my studio. Mm -hmm. I deduct part of my utilities, but all that mm -hmm. stuff, you know, um, things you don't think about, like, can you deduct yeah. mileage or gas? You have to pick one. Oh, did you know that? You know, I'd be like car repairs. How much can yeah. you get a CPA? Never. And the rules change every year. So yep. save and log everything. I remember one year it was like, oh, well, you didn't save your clothing receipts. You could have written that off. And I was like, well, damn it. So the next year I saved all my receipts for clothing and I go in again, and like, yeah, no, you can't write that off this year. I'm like, yep. Yeah. Doesn't yep. matter. Save everything. If you can justify it, save yep. it. 
<laughs> if it's even remotely a part of your know. business in the slightest, save it. And then when tax season comes around and you can write that off, maybe mm-hmm. cool. The worst thing they can tell you is no. Mm-hmm. But if they say yes, you get and more you deduction. <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. And so yeah. to that end, like <laughs> you were talking about, this is where I keep my receipts. I feel, you. <laughs> I feel you. So I'm actually going through all of mine at the moment. Like I have yet to file my taxes from last year. Yeah. I, like I got to a point and then I realized oh, I didn't include all this income. So like when I get a receipt, I put it in like a folder and then I realize what, yeah. so I've got too many different things. I'm looking at checkbooks. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. highlighting bank statements. So that way you don't have to keep receipts. Um, you know, so if you, if, the less cash and checks you have, the easier it is because it's all on your bank statements. You just highlight them and then you categorize mm-hmm. them. Well, that's how mm-hmm. old school I was doing it. Mm-hmm. I just signed up for something called Zero X E R O, which um, is like my my CPA said, you know, because I uh, anyway, uh, my CPA said sign up for uh, QuickBooks, and I looked at QuickBooks mm-hmm. and I looked mm-hmm. at Zero, and a, a, another person recommend. She walked me through both and looks like Zero. Um, is going to be the best fit. So I'm doing, they're giving you a mile, a mile, a month long trial. So that way it basically, it's kind of like mile IQ instead of just swiping right and left, you can just input all your expenses. And at the end of the year, you send the link to your CPA. It's done. Mm -hmm. I love that. So, and also Mm -hmm. there's one other book. If you guys, I, I'm a nerd yet tell like too many books. There's there's (laughs) another book I don't have right here, but it's called profit first by Mike Malkowitz. Not heard of this. It's brilliant. It's how to pay yourself first. You set up a profit yeah. loss. And all this stuff they don't teach you about finances yeah. is really mm-hmm. important. So that way, like you said, when you have to pay quarterly, you've got the money mm-hmm. just in mm-hmm. case. And if you didn't have that mm-hmm. much, it's fine. You've got extra. Mm-hmm. It's okay. So this is how you set up this. So this is how you can show a profit. So when you maybe build a space for your studio or your whatever, or you mm-hmm. need to have business expenses, paid. you've got all this paid. Mm-hmm. You can show investors at some point, Hey, look, I'm profitable. And this is how you do it. They don't, they don't tell you any of that. So. Also. Yeah. And, and we're in a very credit based society right now. And that is so dangerous for so many reasons. And, you know, you think, okay, like, okay, we're going to save up for this. We're going to save up for that. We're going to have all these expenses that we don't expect one that got me that I didn't see coming because I'm like, Oh, well, I'll just save up because I need this thing coming. That's, that's fine. That's how I wrote hospital bills. If they are out of network or not covered for whatever reason, Oh, that hurt. Oh, that hurt bad. And I did not have the savings for it. I had to make that phone call to the hospital billing department and be like, ah, <laughs> they were very reasonable. They're like, let's set up a payment plan. It's great. But you know, I was paying on that forever, mm-hmm. forever. Um, it took me like two years to pay that off. Yeah. Unfortunately, the payments were small and that's, that's why, but I'm like, okay, but in the meantime, I've got this, I've got to pay. I've got that. I've got to pay. And now this is hitting me. Have savings, pay yourself into your savings. First thing, sure no matter what oh my god that is the best decision i made and it unfortunately took that for me to learn it yeah. um and the other thing i want to mention before we get too far away with, from it um we were talking about bank statements and highlighting and this that and the other and like i am looking into those apps that you can just send to the cpa like i'm i'm getting there this year um but what i didn't know about until i started tuned and toned was um, I bank through a credit union. Um, Wonderful. I love my credit union. I really do. They gave me a free business account. Free. Free one? Free. Checking and savings. Free. And I'm like, everything I buy comes out of that account. If it's business related, everything that I make goes into the account. If it's business related, you know, everything. So at the end of the year, all I had to do was print out that year's bank statements and go, this is an expense. This was me paying myself. And, you know, like it, it didn't take me 10 minutes to sort everything. It was great. And I'm like, I don't have to worry because uh, I'm still sole proprietor. So it's LLC. If you do that route, you have to separate your money and make sure you never mix it. Or if you shut down, you will lose everything you own instead of just the business. But sole proprietor is like, okay, well, I can just, yeah, I lost my train of thought on that. That's gone. Okay. Do you know that you guys know about like doing business as Ashley? Do you have that? I 
made my own a few times, but like I said earlier, um, a lot of my business was word of mouth. So mm -hmm. as soon as like a few parents were extremely happy with how I was teaching their kid and, you know, the success that they were having, then it kind of just spidered out to other families, um, contacting me for lessons. No, no, no. I mean, DBA, but, like yeah. doing business. Doing business oh, sorry. I totally heard <laughs> wrong. It's okay. So say it one more time because I think like part of it is I'm reading the transcript. <laughs> <laughs> DBA. DBA. Doing business. <laughs> it just went nuts. Yeah. Doobie 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 doo. <laughs> <laughs> Doing business as. As. Yeah. Okay. So I I'm sole proprietor. I don't I don't even though I have Hagedorn strings. That's again like my little umbrella like representation of me, but I don't actually have an LLC on it. Not um, an LLC, a DBA. But, right. So, so legally, Ashley, I think all of your checks get made out to you personally as Ashley Hagedorn Bryan. Yes. My checks can be made legally to Tuned and Toned Performance because I own that name as an alternate name. Um, Angela, I think that's what you're talking about. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hadn't even gone down that route at all because I like it just made life easier with um, me just keeping my, my name because a lot of, a lot of them yeah. knew me yeah. before I decided to like, just have a little logo mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, and have my page on, on Instagram or whatnot on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So I just kept with what I knew. Again, yeah. that's something that they probably should teach in, in university because it's something that honestly, I may never change. I probably yeah. will just continue to get paid just under my legal name and mm -hmm. that be it. Um, it will take like a major move or something, potential like yeah. huge life changing something for me to switch over. Um, but I don't think it makes sense for you to do that with what you do because the orchestras that are hiring you, um, they're, they're going to make the check out to you directly anyway, just because yeah. of how that process works for their taxes. And since you're mostly word of mouth, even if you weren't like, but they know they're coming to you for private lessons mm -hmm. um, versus I feel like um, maybe it doesn't even really make sense for me. Um, I think it makes sense for you, Angela, because you've got so many people online and, and distance and they're looking at music strong as the business. Um, and I'm kind of in that transition period, but it's that when you're getting to um, less potential one-on-one -on -one work, every single thing you do um, or orchestral work. And that's kind of where you're the majority of your balance is when you're getting into businesses or not business, I'm sorry, classes and seminars and I think that's where that starts to make more sense. Um, I don't think it's a bad idea if you're like, oh, well, I'm just going to private teach and, and work for, you know, orchestras. I don't think it's a bad idea to have uh, a DBA, but I think it kind of is one of those, it depends on what you want to do. Gotcha. Yeah. There's, there's all this stuff, <laughs> DBA, LLC, all this stuff. They don't tell you. Are you an mm -hmm. escort? What's an escort? You know, like oh they don't yeah. teach you any of this business. And, and then you're like, was I supposed to? How am I supposed to know? And then you don't know. Like I just got involved with the Entrepreneur Center here in Nashville and it's so eye-opening, but all these people, they, and I'm like, I don't know what these words mean. They're like, what's your avatar? I'm like, is that a movie? I'm like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you know. And then why do B2B? Do you do B2B or B2C? Like, what does that mean? I mean, like there's just like a whole nother terminology. And you know, it's, it's like, I really feel like schools of music have got, I mean, there, there are a lot of them that are starting these entrepreneurial program stuff, but they've really got to start treating us um, not just as performers, because I got my degrees in performance as well. And I was just thrown out there with no whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and I mean, thankfully I've been teaching since eighth grade, no lie. First yep. student, mm -hmm. eighth grade, mm -hmm. $5 mm -hmm. came to my house. And my yep. band director's like, you know more than her, right? Then you can teach her. I went, okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> but like, there's so much you don't know. And I really feel like these schools of music really, and I say forced to take, it should just be part of the curriculum. You've yeah. got to have some business courses. You've got to have some yeah. know-how, some marketing. 
mm-hmm. I feel like I am, I am constantly reading books and podcasts and stuff, just trying to catch up. Mm-hmm. You know? And I've been out of school for 15 years now or something. So it's like, this should be taught, not just, okay, you've got this degree. Now go learn how to make a business. It's too late. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You just spent four years and lots and lots of money or I guess or six or eight or six or eight <laughs> or, years, 12. or 12 or <laughs> 12 and lots of money, lots and lots of money that you eventually either pay out of pocket or you pay back yeah. eventually, maybe what? either yeah. way you're paying for it. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I know, like we just went, woo. <laughs> I know, I told you that was going to be a whole lot of things. Like, are there, like, what, oh, what are the yeah. things you wish they taught you? They're just so, so There's many. There's so many. And yeah, actually, you, go, ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead. Just going to say, we were talking about logos and you don't have to have, depending on what you want your business to be, you do not have to have a really professional, amazing, expensive mm-hmm. logo. When I discovered, when I decided that I was going to be a business and I wasn't just going to, you know, that I had a bigger overarching idea for what I wanted. Um, I knew I needed a logo and I, my dad's like, I just made mine with clip art. I'm like, it's not going to work for me. So <laughs> I didn't want that. So I hired somebody to do my logo and that's got to be 2012, I think. And it's still relevant, still looks great. Mm-hmm. That's $300 is what I spent on that. Best $300 I've ever spent because it's on everything. I mean, <laughs> it's on my cars, it's yeah. on my clothes, it's on my business cards. And you want it to be something recognizable. So if you're going to yeah. build yourself as a, build a brand and make sure you build yourself as that brand. So people really start to understand depending, you know, depending on what you're going to do, whether it's just, whether it's teaching mm. lessons or gigging or, you know, I mean, cause I know a lot of musicians that, that um, they, they gig and their name is fine. They don't need a logo, but if you're, if you're mm. building an actual business, mm. take that into consideration, yeah. you know? Yeah. And make sure it's something you like and you feel that actually represents you and not just what you think people want to see. Cause that, that bit me for a while too. Um, and I, I have this conversation with, um, with my husband all the time where it's like, you know, I try to be very polite, very professional. Um, I really do. And I think I do an okay job. You know, I'm pretty diplomatic. It's not a problem, but every once in a while, somebody says something and I just, I just say what I actually think. And I go, Oh no. You know, like that is so going to bite me. Um, and, or I just, you know, let something out about myself. Like a student finds out that I am a total nerd with my Pokemon that you can probably see on the shelf over here. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, that's going to make me look so, unpre- no, they love it. Mm-hmm. They love it. And it's, I'm like, oh, it's because you're actually seeing me and mm-hmm. not a cut up version of me. Like, no, you're, you're actually here to work with me. Got it. Okay. <laughs> um, and it's the same thing with the logo. Like, oh, well, I need something. Make sure you like it. Make sure it represents you. Yeah. Um, and if you if you don't have $300 to drop on a logo first thing, um, Fiverr is a website. Um, I think it has two R's on it. I can't remember. Yeah. It, Fiverr. Um, and it's a bunch of people mostly overseas, but you can sort by rating and by number of purchases, whatever it's cheap. And you can have them bid on like, I want X, Y, Z. And they'll, people will bid and be like, I'll do it for this little, I'll do You pick the one that you like best. Um, Freelancer.com. Great. Yeah. Great place to start. I got my entire book reformatted through Upwork by somebody in India. Yeah. Yeah. But you know. when it comes to your logo and your marketing, Ashley, have you seen this? People don't read. They don't read. They look at the pictures no. and ask yeah. the questions. They don't read. I have my logo on the back of my cart. It says Music Strong. That's the logo, right? Mm-hmm. Fitness training for musicians. And then my phone number and website. Do you know how many calls I've gotten about Music Strong in like five years? Do you know how many calls I've gotten to go, hi, do you teach piano lessons? <laughs> hi, do you teach banjo? Hi. Hey, do you, uh, I'm like the last time that happened, I was in rush hour and we were stopping guys like, Hey, I'm just sitting behind you. Uh, do you teach piano lessons? And I said, sir, did you read that? It says fitness. Did I just lost it? I was like, he goes, no, ma'am, I didn't read it. And I went, no, I don't teach piano lessons. <laughs> People don't read. I'm like, what part of guitar comes out of fitness? What? Cause they don't read. Remember people yeah. do not read. They look at pictures. They do not read. Yep. 
They will yes. tell you. What's really funny is they will tell you, no, I didn't read it. But you called? <laughs> <laughs> and you tell it's people, funny. though, if you remember nothing, people don't read. <laughs> <laughs> Right? I don't know if you've, if you've heard you've had this, but it's, it's, it happens frequently. Yeah. yeah. I'm lucky where yeah. my logo is literally just my name and strings afterwards. And then if we really want to go into that, I have a, a violin bow that underlines those words. Very yeah. simple. If you go that simple, then they're kind of forced to read. <laughs> you, say this. you say this. <laughs> I know, but I mean, with strings, then they assume that I also teach guitar and there's yes. uh, so inquiries uh -huh. on that. And honestly, uh -huh. like you build by I, <laughs> I taught beginning guitar in school, but yeah. I will recommend all yeah. other people. I will never okay. touch mm -hmm. private guitar lessons because that is not, not me. And even yeah. so, like technically if I I've gone that broad with strings, there's the assumption that I also teach cello and bass. And that is also yeah. not a thing. And maybe yep. eventually I'll LLC it and make it like a business business where I have people who teach under my name. Yeah. Cool. I've set it up where that's a thing. So yeah. maybe one day we'll get there. But for now, like I'm just doing my own thing. It's easy. Mm -hmm. I'm a one man show. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yep. That's, Seriously, every it's time so I get funny. one of these calls, I just have to be like, <sighs> How do you, it says fitness training. How, how do you do yeah. guitar or voice lessons? I really don't, I, I, because you have yep. a treble clef. Yeah. Treble clef. I mean, there's yeah. a barbell in it. There's just a yeah. barbell. It took me a while to actually realize that was a barbell to be fair. <laughs> People see music and they quit. So it says music yeah. strong. They, they don't read the strong. And then they're like, oh, you teach lessons. I'm like. No, no, even <laughs> this is. So it's like, you know. Anyway. Yeah. So yeah. can we can we transition real quick? Um, we could talk about probably apps and unless you have some apps or or other like things that you use that have helped you um in building a, a business or anything like that. Cause I want to talk about your lifting too. <laughs> Honestly, I think we've covered a lot of it. I, like yeah. there's you know, a few uh scheduling things like I, I think probably going on the scheduling, although I don't have like apps per se, because I just use uh, Google. Google is a magic like, overall <laughs> overlord of all the things that I do. Yes. Um, Cause I, I'll have like documents on there that I, I allow students to be able to, I give them permission to edit if I need mm -hmm. to, depending on like, let's say I'm, I'm, doing like a studio recital and I want them to input that for their program, like to make sure that I don't misspell any of their names or whatever, yeah, like the they go in and edit the program. Oh, Google Docs. Google Docs. Google Docs. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. I was gonna say yeah. Docs, but no, Google Docs makes sense. Google Docs. And then um, I also use um, the Google Calendar. So they get a reminder you can set the time that they get the reminder, um, however many hours. And then I also have like a 10 minute reminder just so that they're hopefully not late to the lesson. Although that sometimes doesn't necessarily mean anything cause they might be, you know, a few minutes late or yeah. 15 minutes late. That's like my yeah. cutoff 15 minutes and like, Oh, sorry, you don't have a lesson now. Um, yeah. anyway, cause but, then they're running into your other students. Exactly. I always put like a at least for these online lessons, I put 15 minute buffer periods so that like, I'm not sitting in front of a screen forever, but that's, we're going off topic. So I, I truly use Google and like the Gmail and all of those things that they offer on there to their mm -hmm. full extent. And I recommend just playing with a lot of the stuff that they have. Mm -hmm. I love your idea about having the kids edit a Google doc that makes it. So if you're doing a recital, that's, oh, that, mm -hmm. that's, Again, anything you can do to shove responsibility onto them then take it off of you. So yeah. Good. And especially yeah. like, at least when I was teaching in public school, I had the roster given to me. So all I had to do was like copy paste the roster onto my program. Yeah. But now it's just lessons. And I have, you know, some students who have um, culturally difficult names for me <laughs> to spell and pronounce. Yes. And 
that's totally fine. It makes more sense for them to go insert their own name. So if it's yeah. misspelled, it's because they messed it up and not because of me. And <laughs> I, I like, that's something that I've always had a problem with. Like when, even when I was a kid, like you don't want your name misspelled. It's the worst thing. And yeah. just like to throw in a little like, uh -uh, every time Hagedorn is said and the closed captioning, misspells my name with an e <laughs> it does it does oh <laughs> god dorn yeah so with that being said like it's just one of those things that irks people and it's the details you know like the tiny details you don't want your name misspelled mm -hmm. on a piece of paper and so i let them do it yeah yeah i will include links to the the other two scheduling uh music teachers helper and my music staff because they also do that when you you schedule it it links to your google calendar and it shows up in your calendar <laughs> my cat says hi sorry he's decided that it's it's time for attention okay so i, I think that's all super brilliant i'll include links in the show notes to all of these things thank you so much um but real quick can we talk about lifting and oh yeah yes let's go i love it oh yes <laughs> I don't know where to start. I don't know you yet. <laughs> uh, totally fine. Uh, should I start with like how I got started? Yeah. What sure. kind of lifting do you do and how you got started and how it benefits you as a musician? All those things. Okay. So I guess I should say like right now I'm like, it's a combo of do whatever postpartum thing I can do, but it's like in the realm of like strongman. Because I am trying to build up to do my first competition in August. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, seven months ago, we had my little Madeline. <laughs> Yay! So you had a baby seven months ago, and in what will that be? What almost a year? It'll be the competition ten months. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's, that's incredible! Months. Good for you. Yeah. So, I guess like. Any other lady, uh, typical lady who wants to get fit, like join some fitness classes way back in the day and like just did that and thought cardio was the end all be all. Like that's how I'm going to lose weight. That's how I'm going to be fit. And like, yeah, I did get a little bit skinnier and I started running. And then um, I decided to go a little bit crazy and follow Jen into CrossFit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually technically my husband started crossfit because of yeah. her beau the two of them convinced mm -hmm. him to go to crossfit and then eventually after i quit public school teaching and was like okay i think i can handle going back to something like that again and i joined crossfit and it was the craziest thing i've ever done yep. um yeah Yep. <laughs> there were like every day I'd have to take a break. I couldn't go like back to back days because the next day I was just on my couch dead. Yeah. And like just alive enough to go teach lessons. And that was it. <laughs> so, um, but like as things progressed and like I got, I again followed Jen into another gym and did some um, powerlifting slash weightlifting. I couldn't really decide what I wanted to do, but everything mm -hmm. like just, lifting heavy things a lot of general strength type a stuff. lot of general strength mixed, stuff mixed approach general strength <laughs> i was just like oh my god this is amazing look at all these things i can lift and the different ways that i can lift them it was just amazing um but we did like you know slow approach just try mm -hmm. everything and find out what my limits were and just slowly build on them mm -hmm. um but then i started like kind eventually it, it's starting to hone in and it started to hone in towards strongman stuff and so um that decision was kind of made while i was pregnant um <laughs> which is an <laughs> interesting decision to make while you're pregnant like it's not one that you just you know think a pregnant woman should make but that's what i did uh, but i was like to preface this I was already lifting heavy things and working out regularly before I got pregnant. So yeah. like disclaimer, don't just start lifting heavy things when you're pregnant. Like right. you <laughs> need to already have a regimen. If you don't find someone who can help you get started 
very safely. easily and do it safely yeah. um because the last thing you too. <laughs> like you don't want to mess yourself up your body's already going through major changes um so yeah. i lifted with that said i did lots of lifting oh i would say like probably four days a week four mm-hmm. to five days a week um almost about a month out until i gave birth and um i even hit prs while i was pregnant i had a deadlift pr and a back squat pr while five months pregnant get it (laughs) yeah so um now like so getting out like the first six weeks postpartum just rest like Mm -hmm. all the resting although Mm -hmm. weirdly enough you don't think about it but the amount of times you have to lift baby and do things with baby you actually are working out it Mm -hmm. just doesn't seem like it it's like lightweight Mm -hmm. lots of reps like that's the style of working out that you're doing without realizing it and then when I got back in the gym because I had like you know taken that time for myself and again six weeks is like kind of pushing it but I was like I have to lift heavy things. Like (laughs) I just couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand being away for so long. Um, Then we just went ahead and like, again, slowly built up. I knew that I could not go very heavy at all. It was just going through the motions. And eventually like Mm -hmm. three months postpartum, I was doing heavy, actual heavy heavy lifting again um, and hitting PRs again, which is just nuts. I yeah. didn't think that, that was a possibility, <laughs> but like my story is not an exclusive, like anomaly. I'm not a unicorn. Right. Anyone can do this if they go about it the right way. Yeah. Yeah. Probably thinking <laughs> my guess is like when you, when you, when you, after you gave birth, you want to get back to right where you were, but you have to give yourself some grace and some time. Mm-hmm. You're like, Nope, that's where I was stuff has happened <laughs> let's let's ease back into it and this, this this is not just when you give birth but this is also you know if you've taken time off for an injury or yeah. just time off in general yeah you did hit that pr like i'm thinking when i get back into bike riding i'm thinking did i really do 100 miles sometimes 20 is a struggle today you know like it's okay yeah. and if you don't want to get back into it all the way that's fine but it, it's okay to be a beginner again and not even a beginner but to yeah. like go back to some basics and start lower again and work your way up can that I don't know but your your story I mean have have you found that it's kind of fun to work your way back up sometimes oh, yeah it's it's like okay um and I think it's like more fun because I'm realizing like all the different muscles and like workings of my body like I am so much more aware having to mm-hmm. work my way back up again and like when you first start working out like you're just like okay let me hit you know, lift this really heavy weight. Cool. I did the thing, but you don't know all the things that went into that. Like maybe your trainer did knew all the things, but being forced to jump all the way back down to near square one with the amount of weight and then working your way back up, like you're starting to realize, Oh, like I feel my lats way more here. Um, you know, my glutes, certain parts of my glutes are working more or less depending on this type of squat. Like, oh, I might be leaning to the side just a little bit. And like, you're finding all the tiny things that eventually when you start to actually get back to your weight that you left off on, that's easy because you've, you're already targeting all the, the, the tiny things that you maybe weren't really focusing on at the time of the heavy lifts but had to focus on all the on the way back and then it'll be a stronger lift i pr literally every single lift postpartum yeah every single one yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and doing things that i wasn't expecting to do like with the strongman competition you're required to take uh, like a keg 100 pound mm-hmm. keg and throw it over a bar Mm-hmm. And I would never done something like that before, like ever. I hadn't even lifted a keg before with any weight in it mm-hmm. to be exact. Mm-hmm. And so to go like postpartum, what was it? That was only a couple months ago. 
not even a couple months ago. No, I think it was like six weeks max, maybe. Yeah, maybe, so maybe six. Technically, it was five, month. five months postpartum to yeah. be doing things that I'd never tried before. It's yeah. kind of crazy. Yeah. It's and you lifted awesome. the heavy keg. <laughs> yeah. 125 pounds. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Which, no. you know, for, <laughs> when you're working with other implements and it's like a, for a sandbag, yeah, 125 is a lot, but it's not like a lot, a lot, you know, whatever. But a keg, like different kinds of kegs. I'm going to nerd out here for a second. Just bear with me. Solid kegs, not that bad to maneuver. Sand kegs, kind of a pain in the butt. Water kegs, which is what you lifted, that it moves on you. Water? water Dude. yeah yeah she did wow. <laughs> sorry i gotta brag about you actually yeah it was i honestly was super nervous jen can attest to this i was staring at it for like minutes just wondering if i should even <laughs> attempt it and then after oh her doing it multiple times i was like okay i mean like throw the ego out the door for just a second let me just try this Mm-hmm. whether or not it happens I'm not going to like I'm going to be very neutral about this if it happens it happens it doesn't whatever and then it happens and then it happened eight more times after that like yeah, it, <laughs> <laughs> it was great yeah it did it was a good lift <laughs> yeah. but I think just like the women postpartum or just women in general and then musicians also and the fact that like it took me a while to get there because I believed and I guess this is just an inherent thing that everyone believes or is I guess taught and I guess I didn't realize that I was taught this but like don't don't do anything really crazy physically because then you're gonna hurt your ability to play your instrument Mm -hmm. um and boy oh boy is that just like the complete opposite because I had some serious back issues all through high school, through college, up until I actually started working out, lifting weights specifically, not just working out, lifting weights and working on muscle specifically. As soon as I got stronger with my lower lats, my back problems just gone. I would sit in those like two to three (laughs) hour rehearsals in orchestra or Mm -hmm. in a pit for musical. Mm -hmm. And have yeah. no pain playing my viola. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, it's just, and it, honestly, like, I tell other musician friends of mine, and they're like, uh, you're like, it's just amazing. You going mm-hmm. to the gym, like, mm-hmm. I, I don't think I could ever do that. And I'm like, but you absolutely could. You absolutely could. Like, maybe yeah, yeah. not doing the weight that I'm posting. Like, of course, I'm posting like mm-hmm. all of my wins because I'm freaking proud as you of what I can do, but yeah. that should not be like a deterrent. And it's just like, that's just the established thing. Everyone believes like, if you yeah. can't like, if your profession shouldn't, you're going to hurt yourself. You're fragile. Mm, the whole like being yeah. fragile oh no not fragile no <laughs> you're not. not fragile you're just weak right now and you just have to work your way up yeah you and you, you can become fragile and the less you work out the fragiler you will become <laughs> that's not a word that, that. <laughs> yeah so yeah yeah that's it, it, people people look at you like you're crazy and it's like no, I just am not afraid anymore. Yeah. I've taken that power back. Like, <laughs> like, I will totally admit, like, I'm still afraid of grip mm-hmm. a little bit. And it's mostly mm-hmm. because, like, I do have weak grip, which is funny for, like, a violin viola player. You'd think that I'd have a pretty decent grip because that's what I'm constantly doing. No, because that's no. not, it's, it's working on like a dexterity. I'm not working on yeah. strength when I play my instrument ever. Yeah. That's just not a thing. Nope. So exactly. you actually have to go and work on it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Has that's it, why. has it helped your, sorry. Cause it hints why I have the business I have. There you go. Who just gave me the best marketing speech. Can I steal that? 
I do it. <laughs> do it. Absolutely. What I do. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. yeah. Yep. Thank you for, for putting that out. To more, more musicians need to hear that from musicians. Yeah. Yeah. You're not yeah. in direct relation to how strength training helps you as a musician, gets rid of pain. And it's not, you know, like blind, random YouTube workouts. This is, this is structured strength training. Yeah. yeah. And I'd just like to throw it out there as well. Um, like the, the tiny muscle workings that you rely on for your instrument. I had to, con like, before I started working out, I had to go get massage therapy every two weeks mm -hmm. to just make sure mm -hmm. I was relaxed enough to play my instrument. I wouldn't even say comfortably, just play my instrument and get through rehearsals and yeah. general practice. I don't have to do that anymore. I don't get massages, right? I, if I get a massage, it's for comfort and pleasure not because I have to get therapy and so like just switch that you getting into the gym and you lifting weights and working on muscles is mm -hmm. it's physical therapy for the benefit of your playing yeah yeah and that's um just to just to throw this into the fray because I, I know somebody's going to think this I just you just after a while you just hear it in the ether you know <laughs> like it doesn't mean you have to switch right away. It doesn't mean you cut out massage therapy, cold turkey. It just means no. that it allows you to transition. I did it allows both. you to not need it. Yeah. yeah. I did both for a full year uh, mm -hmm. before I was comfortable to say, okay, I don't need to go get a massage. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it didn't even take that long. My massage therapist was telling me, oh, your muscles are not as tense anymore. Um, and then like maybe two months down the road, she's like, wow, this, you're like really getting strong. I can feel it, but like your muscles are not tense. Like they used to be. And it's because I was like overworking certain things to make my the ability to play happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and now I'm using the right muscles. You were creating muscle compensations to get you through, to do what you needed to do. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. And that's and another conversation we've had about, oh, you know, our muscle compensation is bad. No, but in this instance, this is how they can be bad. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the sad part is like, I complained about all of these things through high, not as much high school because it was like, who was I going to say this to? I, I told my violin teacher occasionally, I don't, I, don't mm, I may not have even told him because I wasn't, I thought maybe just marching band because I was a band and a string kid. I did youth orchestra because there was no orchestra at school and I did band at high school. So I just thought I was like tired from marching band or whatever, like all the activities that I did in a single day. But in college, when I like, you know, you have to pick one, pick an instrument. So my viola professor, I like was telling her all of, you know, my issues. And that's when she suggested going to massage therapy and potentially getting, you know, different things, uh, Oh my gosh, words are hard after postpartum when you get needles. Acupuncture. Thank you, acupuncture. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many alternate things that you can do to try to mitigate that pain, but like all musicians, at least for now, we're, we're going to change that. Um, musicians for now are just like, go get these other things, but never, yeah. oh, go hit the gym. It's never strength. Why, yep. why is it always, just do yoga. Maybe you should stretch. I think running is safe. Running's about as safe as driving a car is oh. as safe as doing a deadlift. It's all, it's all I've injured myself it. more with running than I've ever, like I've never injured myself with strength okay. training. I've injured, like severely injured myself twice while running. You know, yeah. I don't um, know. Yeah. And once while I was actually the coach of a middle school like cross country team. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then eventually I had to follow them on one of those, like, you know, the scooter things where you prop up your leg because it's immobile and then you just scoot yourself along. I'm well acquainted. Yeah. I broke my foot last year and had, uh, I don't do that for six, eight weeks. Not fun. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so yeah, running is not the answer. Like running won't help you as a musician necessarily. No. No, it's good for like 
let's running is good for running yeah <laughs> that's what it's good for if right. you use it certain ways it can be helpful i will i will because i mean i do put that in my programming to some degree um and if I could figure, I'm, I'm still working on a particular imbalance in my lower body for running that's currently keeping me from it. But there's something to be said for cardio when it's used the right way. Mm, but right. like, oh, running is safe because you're a musician. Where do you even get that from? I mean, How you're not going to damage your hands most likely unless you fall, but you could fall. Right down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it put me out of commission. I fell and caught myself with my left hand, which is like the worst thing I could have done. But you can't help the kind of reaction you're no. going to have when you're falling in that split second. And I caught yeah. myself and I was in a brace for six weeks. Yeah. And that could have happened walking across campus too. Yeah. You know, like, oh, you're going to throw your back out because you're deadlifting. I threw my back out during my doctorate reaching for a piece of paper a <laughs> single single not not like one <laughs> Sorry. that was the last time i got really hurt one piece of paper i started deadlifting and that hasn't happened since yeah, <laughs> in middle school classroom i threw out my back because i sneezed i was 29 years old 29 years old, I sneezed before the class started and I had to teach from my desk because I could not get up because I threw out my back and that was before I started lifting. Yep. And mm -hmm. it hasn't happened since. Like I don't yeah. have back issues that I'm scared of like moving the wrong way. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously postpartum again, like the, the right after you give birth, you have to be careful because like joints mm -hmm. are loose and like all kinds of things, but like, that's the exception, yeah. at least for me, that was the exception. And uh, since then, I am not afraid to move. I'm not afraid to like help, you know, my mom is, likes to sit down and play with my daughter but because she had some knee surgery, it's hard for her to get back up. I can lift her off the ground and not have to worry about hurting myself in the process. And yeah. she trusts that like when she sits on the floor that I'm going to be able to get her back up. Yeah. Bingo. Uh-huh. Life, life skills through strength yeah. right there. <laughs> that message needs to go out so much mm -hmm. more. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, yes, it's functional fitness, but it's also, you, you know, it, I don't know. That I think people it's forget really that, that it's functional fitness. Yeah. I think they, like, they think weightlifting or strongman or powerlifting and they assume, oh, just people with big muscles. Like you're, that's all you're trying to do. You're just trying to get big muscles. Um, no, it's for function. Mm -hmm. it, it's <laughs> funny that you say that because people think, you know, strength training and they immediately mentally picture a bodybuilder. I'm like, it's Angela and I have, we've talked about this so many times. Bodybuilding is a sport and a lot of them are, and, and somebody's going to get mad at me for saying this. Okay. I'm not talking about the exception. I'm talking about a lot of them. A lot of them are not that strong. A lot of them I can outlift. The big, bulky, you know, six foot whatever, jacked dudes, I can outlift them. They're not lifting for strength. They're lifting for They're size. They're lifting for size. They're That's a different thing. Yep. <laughs> the two can yeah. relate, and there is crossover. But yes. Yes. Mutually exclusive. Yeah. No, I love bodybuilding techniques. I love incorporating those methods, but like, I mean, I don't think I'm that jacked yet. <laughs> I've been at this for a couple of years. <laughs> because no one's accused me of using steroids, so there it is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah, not you know, <laughs> Life goals. Get accused right. of using steroids. <laughs> I got my first. Oh my goodness. <laughs> really? That, I think this last 10 minutes has just been like the most, <laughs> I want to like use this, use this as like the, this is going to be like our sound clip going forward, like in our intro. This is what this, yeah. thank you, Ashley, you rock. <laughs> we haven't a sound clip intro yet, but we're gonna, and this is going to be you. <laughs> yeah. Nice. 
Yeah, uh -huh. It's a lot of fun. And the, the coolest part is that my students have seen the progress. Many of them, like there's a few of the newer ones that like, they just know me for the last, you know, several months and they haven't seen the difference. But the students who have seen me before and after, like even the parents have things to say. They're just like, mm -hmm. wow, it's just so awesome to see the journey that you've been on. And like, there were many times where I like, would walk in after CrossFit and barely be able to play my instrument for them to demonstrate. But then like when I switched over to actual like strong fit or just lifting weights for the benefit of all my muscles, um, I didn't have that problem anymore. And a lot of the parents noticed like, oh, you're not sore, but I saw you do the deadlift yesterday or this morning. And like, mm -hmm. how are you not sore after that? And I was just like, it's the training. It's that's the type of training that I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. And I have gotten a couple parents to join me occasionally. How yeah. fun. Yeah. <laughs> How fun is that? Yeah. Yeah. But it's like yeah. trying to kick that stereotype of frail out the door for my students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's gonna it's gonna take some time to trickle down, but man. I really hope it does. I'm I'm waiting for it. <laughs> We're on a mission. We're yeah. on a mission. Get it done. Sorry, that was that shook my whole screen. <laughs> hey, that's the thing that's missing out of music schools. Fitness for musicians. Working on it. Working on it. <laughs> working on it. <laughs> yeah, working on it. If yeah. you're a music school and you want to hire somebody to teach fitness, I volunteer as tribute. And I know Angela does too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it needs to be not just a, a here and there, like in a, a like, uh, like workshops help schools of music maintain their accreditation. It needs to be part of the curriculum, yep. not just a, a one-time workshop. Some people might show up to B yep. something that you think of as an afterthought or C when somebody gets injured, you think of this. No, this needs to be preventative. I mean, I know that pain is a powerful motivator and, and we don't like thinking of insurance for our bodies because we don't really think of that. We don't think about things until it hurts, right? But with the statistics that are showing up and I say up to 93% because that's what I've seen, but it's, as, yeah. it's usually 60 to 80% of musicians, up to 93% oh. of musicians experience playing related pain or injury. Those stats, that's not 10, 20%. That's stupid high. There is no excuse for schools of music to not put this in their curriculum along with business. Yep. I haven't seen anything since the 70s. It wasn't over like 73%. That's that's the lowest number I've seen. Like 60 is a from, unrealistic. 2005, that's 93%. Yeah. 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 And that's the more common number. Everything, the most recent numbers have been over 90%. If you in the most recent studies. Yeah, if you, I mean, literally any, any time I give a, a workshop presentation, whether it's live in person or a, a, whatever, a convention or whatever, I ask in the, the room, literally anytime I give a convention, a, a pro, a, words are hard, here we go, <laughs> a, a presentation at a convention, it's standing room only. I'm always shocked at the amount of people that show mm -hmm. up because we're talking about strength and people don't talk about strength. They're afraid of it for some reason, but it's not bodybuilding for, for flute players. That's not what we're talking about, right? Yeah. But I ask how many of you have ever experienced playing related pain or, or have been in pain or had an injury because you played an instrument? Nine times out of 10, like nine out of 10 hands go up, not eight out of 10, not seven out of 10, nine out of 10. It's most everybody. So these are real life statistics that play mm -hmm. out. Ask mm -hmm. any group of musicians mm -hmm. who's had playing related pain or injury. I, yeah. Yeah. And the remaining 10% usually just don't mentally quantify discomfort they have as playing related well my hips are kind of tight but you know i've been sitting you've been sitting a lot because you're in orchestra and you're gripping your hips because you're trying to support your instrument yeah. that's playing related and yes it qualifies as an injury or pain hmm. it does yeah. it does it qualifies um playing an instrument shouldn't hurt yeah nope i think it's unfortunately going to take Aside from time and enough people finally just doing what we're doing, like, no, we're going to make this a thing. Like, no, I'm not afraid to talk about it. Um, or, and, and from injured people 
to people who go, well, I used to have this issue and now I'm better. Or yes, even though I didn't have any issues, my playing is now exponentially increased. Yeah. I'm going to take all of that. And I think it's going to take a couple of schools who finally cave and finally introduce a full curriculum on it and start producing the most viable and longest lasting top tier performers. Mm -hmm. I know that's there are take. schools that actually have something. I think Indiana and Kentucky have something, but that's okay. all I know. And I don't even know what that is. I don't think it's part of the curriculum. I think it's just something they offer for music students. Which yeah. I think is bizarre. Don't quote me on that. I could be wrong. I haven't looked in a while. But if you are listening to this and you know of a school of music that offers some kind of fitness training for musicians as part of their curriculum or business, know. please let leave us know. Please let us yep. know. So we can yeah. highlight that and get news yeah. and tell people. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think this is probably because I know this has gone quite long for our normal podcast. I think this is probably a good spot to wrap up. I know we've got more to talk about, um, but mm, we should probably wrap up. <laughs> Thank um, you for joining us. You're yeah. Welcome. yeah. Thank, Thank you for, you for joining us. Um, we're definitely going to have to do a part two because <laughs> there's definitely more things we have to cover on this. Um, I know I personally would like to hear about, um, cause I know that we've talked a little bit about, you know, women in music, that sort of stuff, just, just a little bit, but not a lot about, um, work-life balance, you know, maybe children, if you want that, that sort of stuff. And I feel like we'd get some good insight out of you on that. Um, so next time, if you're, if you're listening to this one, keep an eye out for that one. Um, <laughs> So Ashley, where can people find yeah. you if they want more information on you or what you do or et cetera? Uh, you can find me on Facebook or Instagram, um, High Dorn Strings. I have an account for both of those, the business account on Facebook and on Instagram, just High Dorn Strings, H-A-G-A, -A, if you're reading the closed captioning, because <laughs> it is definitely wrong on the closed captioning. Um and if you want to see the lifting stuff, uh, because Instagram, I, I like, that's where I have an open, like me lifting. Um, it's Swagadorn Brian, S W A G A D O R N B R I E N. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And you'll see <laughs> Prego me lifting and deadlifting and squatting and all that good stuff. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> yeah. awesome. Do you have a website or anything? Or no, just no website. I just keep okay. it to social media. I make it real easy. Not a girl. Yep. There we go. Awesome. Yep. All right. Well, thank you again for joining us. Um, and if you're listening, I think you by now know where to find us. But if not, show notes. Show notes are our game. Yes. You know. Um, you can. Sorry. Go ahead. Nope, that's okay. It's in the show notes, wherever you get your podcast. It's also on our YouTube channel. And I have just recently put all of our episodes up on my website where you can listen, share, Sweet. et cetera. That's music. Strong yeah. Music. Yeah. Slash podcast. I think, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it'll be up on my website soon. That's going to get revamped um, within the next two weeks. So you can find that there too. Um, you can find me everything tuned and toned performance. That's tuned with a D and toned with a D, all the ats and the dot coms. Um, or you can watch me personally lift at Doc Beefcake on Instagram. Still more embarrassing than yours, Ashley. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. I'm keeping it. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Doc Beefcake. I'm going to call myself Swift. <laughs> <laughs> so I use this app called True Coach for my online clients. Yeah. And that's the name of their chat bot is Swoltron. <laughs> I just nice. love it. Lord. If you're Doc Beefcake, that's what I'm going to I am Doc Beefcake. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining us, guys.